She returned to our faculty in 1991 and became the chief and has over time become a full professor and chief of our pulmonary division at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. She's known nationally and internationally as an expert in bronchiectasis and remains very active in research in that domain. She's given many national and international talks on the topic and has chaired multiple international meetings. Um, in addition to doing all this kind of work, she serves on the Board of Governors for the Georgetown University Alumni Association, uh, Chair of the Committee on Admissions to Georgetown University School of Medicine, um, and is a longstanding board member of the Catholic University of DC. It is truly a great honor and pleasure to have us talk to her today um, in a lecture given in honor of one of our other uh, educational heroes, Dr. Saul Katz. All right, thank, thank you, Dr. you, Sean. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sean, for that nice introduction. I'm going to give you today a whirlwind tour through some common sleep problems that everyone in the um, Department of Medicine will encounter. Okay, so I have no uh, disclosures and um, uh, with regards to this talk and no financial conflicts. And there will be a number of drugs and uh, devices discussed that are not yet FDA approved. So first, I want to really um, honor Dr. Katz, who saw Katz, the founder of our um, pulmonary division here at Georgetown. Um, Dr. Katz really was inspirational in, in the careers of many of us here, including uh, Dr. Walthorn and myself. And Dr. Katz really um, was a, a superb clinician. You know, he got his start in the 40s and 50s as a TB specialist and sarcoidosis specialist, which is what pulmonary doctors did back then. But he totally embraced the, the growth of our division into this, into the, what it is today, really, with critical care and sleep medicine. And he was a very big proponent of integrating clinical reality with research. So I do want to honor his memory today and, and all that he did for Georgetown and for me personally um, in my career. This is a throwback shot to 30 years ago. This is how the division looked back then. Um, we look a little different now, a little bigger, um, but some of our heroes are still here, Dr. Waltor and Dr. So, and, and I also want to remember Dr. Canner, who was the, the second uh, division chief after Dr. Katz um, and was a great uh, inspiration to all of us. And then I want to really acknowledge uh, Dr. Walthorn, who is the one that talked me into this sleep medicine gig many years ago. And this picture is not him over here, but it, it looks like him, sort of. This is what the sleep lab really looked like um, when things got started here at Georgetown 30 years ago. And we had these old polysomnography uh, machines that were really clunky and had pens and um, Dr. Walthorn and I used to come in at night and titrate CPAP. So sleep has come a long way from how it was when um, he got me into this field and I appreciate it. So what I thought I'd do today is cover um, four common sleep topics um, and really review. There's a, there's a bunch of guidelines that have been published in the last several years on, on each of these topics and I just wanted to it's going to be kind of a high level talk, but a guideline based talk on uh, the four big problems that all of us encounter in patients who have sleep complaints. So first off, we'll talk about insomnia, the difference really between being a short sleeper, like a six hour sleeper versus someone who truly has insomnia, which is more a problem of um, uh, falling asleep and staying asleep, what we call sleep onset and sleep maintenance insomnia. The second type of patient we'll talk about is a patient who's excessively sleepy during the day. And there is a differential diagnosis for that as well, which we'll get into. Is it you know, not enough hours of sleep or actually some sort of uh, primary sleep disorder? The third thing I'm going to touch on briefly is a patient that has abnormal motor activity during sleep. And finally, we'll uh, end up with a discussion on the, the sort of latest guideline-based evaluation and treatment of patients with sleep disorder breathing. So as we know, you know, healthy sleep is, it can be an elusive phenomenon. And, and in our profession, of course, it's, it can be particularly elusive. This is a survey published a, few, a couple of years ago in the MMWR um, that just surveyed a large group of uh, US um, residents 
you can see um, that about two thirds of patients reported a quote unquote healthy sleep duration. The best sleep for state, uh, the best state for sleeping is South Dakota. The worst, uh, who knows why, is Hawaii. And DC was kind of right on the mean for this. And healthy sleep duration is actually lowest in, in um, the populations that I, I listed here. So, you know, getting good quality and quantity of sleep um, can be challenging just in of itself. And then if you add a sleep disorder into the mix, um, you, you know, the patients are really going to have a lot of issues. So let's talk about the first case. Um, this patient we saw recently, a young uh, woman, bas basically healthy. She's a graduate student, not on any chronic prescribed medications. But her chief complaint really was, quote unquote, I'm unable to sleep. And by this, she meant she really was having problems both with uh, trying to fall asleep and, and to stay asleep. And her, her symptoms began when she was an adolescent. Um, she complained of being fatigued during the day, but she's not overtly hypersomnolent. She's not falling asleep without, um, she's not falling asleep during the day in sedentary situations, but she has this generalized sense of fatigue. And you know, this is a pretty common presentation of patients, I'm sure. Everyone has seen a patient like this. So let me talk about how we, uh, in sleep medicine, assess a patient who has an insomnia complaint. Sort of look at the patient as, um, you know, does the patient uh, have comorbidities or, you know, are they just really complaining of insomnia? And uh, some of the comorbidities we like to focus on, of course, are psychiatric comorbidities, um, like I've listed here. And then patients who have insomnia associated with uh, chronic medical problems or even acute medical problems like just acute pain or arthritis type symptoms. So when we assess these patients, um, you know, we want to see, you know, do they have symptoms that suggest a primary sleep disorder that might be disrupting their sleep? And by this, I mean, we ask the patient, you know, do you snore? Do you move your legs at night? Um, you know, are you dreaming excessively? Because we want to make sure we're not missing one of these uh, primary sleep disorders that we're going to talk about a little bit more later. And then again, we ask the patient questions about um, their chronic medical problems and particularly what medications they might be taking because as everybody knows, certain medications definitely um, induce insomnia. One of the things I think sometimes we don't ask enough questions about is the sleep environment. So the third factor that I ask patients about is, you know, what's their bedroom like? Is it cool? Is it dark? Um, you know, is their bed partner part of the problem and that the bed partner snoring? You know, do you have the dog and the cat in the bed? These are things that are, you know, pragmatic, practical questions that uh, really can impact the quality of someone's sleep and contribute to insomnia. And some of the answers, you know, from the patients can be pretty surprising about the rabbit under the bed and, and that kind of thing. Um, the fourth type of insomnia, it's quite common. We call it psychophysiologic insomnia. It's kind of a pattern, a behavioral pattern of poor sleep. Sort of, you know, the, the patient understands when we say, you know, the, the less you sleep, the less you sleep kind of thing. The more anxious you are about uh, being unable to sleep, the more that pattern, that vicious cycle of insomnia continues. And finally, the fifth uh, potential contributor to insomnia in patients is whether they have a primary psychiatric problem like anxiety, a generalized anxiety disorder, depression, bipolar, or um, substance abuse. So I, you know, I did want to say that what, what testing is needed for a patient with insomnia, because you know, this question comes up to us a lot. And I would really stress how important, you know, what I just mentioned is when evaluating the patient with insomnia and that you really just need a thorough review of the history, look at the patient's medications, really ask them to kind of run you through their normal 24 hour day, see what time they're going to bed, how long it takes to fall asleep, et cetera, et cetera. There's really not much lab work that's gonna help you in general with insomnia. Um, but some of the things we do recommend are a sleep diary, which I'll show you in a second here. And um, for some patients, it's actually helpful to, to look at some sort of activity monitoring to help get a sense of, of their sleep patterns. 
and finally, I just want to take home message in working up insomnia that it's pretty uncommon to need a sleep study. It really, most of it will come out in the, in the history, unless the patient, you know, really does have sleep apnea or um, does have excessive motor activity at night. And again, you know, onset of sleep problems, you're not going to find anything on a sleep study. It's the patients with maintenance of sleep problems, you might want to consider uh, doing a formal sleep study. But, you know, this is a sleep diary. There's a lot of different examples of this, but we do give patients these diaries to complete, not, not to obsess about every second of their day, but to give us a general sense of what's happening with bedtime and what time are they awakening and, you know, is, are they on a sort of regular schedule or, or is their schedule very erratic? You know, I think we're really just learning the, the, the role of the Fitbit uh, activity monitor type uh, devices in assessing insomnia. I think that's something that's going to become uh, a more helpful diagnostic tool over the next several years, but not quite there yet. There is a device called an acti actigraphy monitoring, which um, you can see in that bottom panel there. Um, patient wears a wrist device and it picks up motion. And when there's no motion, that's assumed to be uh, when the patient is asleep. Unfortunately, that's not a very widely available clinical tool. It's more of a, a research tool. All right, so you know the patient has insomnia. You've ruled out um, concomitant medical problems or um, psychiatric problems. And you don't think the patient really has a, a primary sleep disorder like apnea or narcolepsy or periodic limb movements. So what do we do to treat insomnia? And this is straight from the guidelines that have just been published by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And really the strong recommendation based on a, a careful evaluation of clinical trials is that the best treatment for insomnia is cognitive behavioral therapy um, that's specifically targeted at patients with insomnia. And the evidence that comes from about 49 studies that were analyzed for this guideline and what they found that people who successfully completed CBTI had improvement in all parameters, including duration of sleep, the durability of response, uh, patient satisfaction, and cost effectiveness. The problem is this therapy is fairly difficult to access for patients. I mean, there are therapists who are CBT um, trained therapists, but a lot of CBT now is, is available online and I'm not trying to advocate for one specific um, online uh, opportunity, but there is this uh, Veterans Affairs um, Design CBTI Coach, it's called, that's an app um, that is actually, can be quite helpful um, for the patient. Um, you know, some of the other therapies that are uh, recommended for use, including um, short uh, CBTI one to four sessions versus full CBTI, which is more like 12 sessions, stimulus control, um, restricting uh, time in bed to sleep only, and relaxation therapies. Um, what is not recommended is just sleep hygiene. So just telling the patient, you know, turn off your screens and don't watch TV and, you know, make the bed room cool and dark is not enough, actually, according to the guidelines. They really need, the patient really needs more than just that advice. And right now there's no recommendations for some of these other things that, you know, may potentially um, show up to be positive, like uh, biofeedback or mindfulness therapy. So let's talk about medications for insomnia. And, and again, it, it, you know, this is not the first line therapy for insomnia, but um, if CBTI and, and sleep hygiene coupled together are not really working, then we do um, think about treating patients with insomnia with medications. So again, from the guideline on um, the pharmacologic treatment of insomnia, uh, published in the uh, journal Clinical Sleep Medicine, the PICO question was, in adult patients with primary chronic insomnia, uh, what intervention improves outcomes compared to placebo. And it turns out, you know, I think this is no surprise to anybody, but the data on medications for insomnia is, is actually pretty weak. And, you know, here's a list of the various types of um, insomnia medications that we have. 
And again, with this analysis that was done um, by the AASM, you can see that um, these five categories of drugs uh, were shown to be um, weakly recommended, um, but benefits probably outweighed harms. So there's the drug called Suvorexant, which is an orexin receptor agonist um, that's on the market. Um, the um, BZD receptor, the Z drugs, right? Um, the three drugs that are BZD receptor agonists. The guidelines give a weak recommendation for the use of one of the old benzodiazepines, temazepam, uh, as well as for melatonin agonists. And the one um, antidepressant that this guideline recommends is doxepin in a low dose. Um, the drugs that um, they, this guideline says uh, the harms outweigh the benefits actually includes trazodone and L-tryptophan. And, you know, I think most of us um, in sleep and, you know, in primary care uh, do prescribe trazodone in a low dose for people with insomnia. But it turns out the data is really quite poor for trazodone and the potential for adverse effects is there. Um, so we do need to be cautious about using trazodone and probably doxepin is a, is a better alternative. And then as you can see, um, benefits equal to harms include one of the other benzos and then drugs that we, we in the sleep world really don't like very much like um, valerian, uh, Benadryl, and even melatonin, which really has minimal benefit for most patients with uh, chronic insomnia. You know, some of the other drugs that we see prescribed um, for insomnia that are either ineffective or not recommended. Um, I've already mentioned the melatonin um, and even the melatonin agonists. The melatonin safe. Melatonin helps people with jet lag, um, but it's probably not very effective um, for most patients with chronic insomnia. And if there is to be an effect, the patient should take it two to three hours prior to the desired bedtime in order to synchronize um, uh, the, the melatonin levels in their system. The, you know, another drug that, of course, we see prescribed for sleep is, um, or class of drugs, is the antipsychotics like quitapine and risperidone. You know, I, I'm sort of anti these drugs, as are the guidelines, because of the um, potential for adverse effects. And a, and a third class of drug that, you know, again, has gained some popularity is gabapentin. You know, gabapentin is an anti-seizure drug that's never been really used for seizure treatment, but has some other um, salutatory effects on nerve ending pain and whatnot. You know, gabapentin was recently changed to a, um, a Schedule Four drug. It does have abuse potential. Um, so at least per the, the current insomnia guidelines is not a recommended uh, insomnia treatment. So back to our patient, um, again, young woman um, complaining of difficulty with onset and maintenance of sleep. You know, we really reviewed her history in detail. Uh, she wasn't taking any medications or any, um, there wasn't any history of substance abuse, got her to keep a sleep diary. And you know the three-prong treatment approach: uh, education about sleep and good sleep behaviors. Um, we recommended the online CBTI, and then started her on low-dose doxepin. So let's turn to another um, complaint that we see, and and again, this is something uh, tend to patients come in um, uh, complaining of excessive daytime sleepiness, and the differential diagnosis is certainly um, based on, you know, the patient's uh, body habitus and whatnot, because the most common reason why people have uh, daytime sleepiness is simply not enough sleep. But if a patient, a young patient comes in who's healthy, has a normal weight, a normal body habitus, no history of, of drug or alcohol abuse, and on no chronic medications, and says, hey, I'm sleepy throughout the day, um, you know, this may be a primary sleep disorder. Um, you know, when we talk to these patients, they, they give us this history of falling asleep in sedentary situations. It's not just fatigue, it's actually dozing off when you shouldn't kind of thing. 
um, and, and when you ask these patients, um, they often tell you that it start, started in adolescence and, you know, they had trouble in school. Um, they, you know, fixed their college schedule to um, get more sleep. And sometimes these patients are treated um, with stimulants because they're diagnosed with um, ADHD or ADD, which uh, may or may not be actual uh, problem here. So when patient comes with excessive daytime sleepiness, again, the sleep history is very important. You want to differentiate fatigue from actual sleepiness. Um, you know, you want to get a history from the patient, whether they might have vivid dreams, either uh, at onset of sleep or, or right before they wake up, uh, whether they're having sleep paralysis and uh, cataplexy, where they're having um, weakness of the muscles with the motion during the day. Now, of course, you know, patients can look up easily what the symptoms of narcolepsy are, and a lot of patients come in saying, I have this and I have that. Um, so you, we really do have to kind of get into the weeds with exactly what they're complaining about. Um, and the differential diagnosis, as I mentioned, you know, the most common reason people are falling asleep in conferences uh, is because they haven't slept enough um, and they acquire a debt of sleep. But sleep disordered breathing, of course, can do it. Um, motor activity, abnormalities, and then sedating medications. But, you know, this patient, um, this is sort of a classic presentation of narcolepsy. Um, and I just did want to spend a minute on this because, you know, many patients with narcolepsy uh, do not get a, a timely diagnosis. You know, they get passed around, as I said, with maybe having ADHD or um, having psychiatric issues. But, you know, if the patient comes in and they're excessively sleepy and they're complaining about vivid dreams and perhaps they have occasional episodes of paralysis, they wake up and they can't move, um, you do have to think about narcolepsy. And right now, you know, the, the gold standard test for narcolepsy remains the sleep study combo of an overnight polysomnogram followed by multiple sleep latency testing the next day. What that involves is, you know, the overnight in the sleep lab to make sure they don't have another type of sleep disorder. And then they stay for a series of um, protocolized naps. Uh, the next day, five naps, 20 minutes each at two hour intervals. And we diagnose what we now call narcolepsy type one or narcolepsy with cataplexy. If they have um, uh, short sleep latency on the naps, like eight minutes or less, and they have two or more uh, REM periods in the five naps, and they also have the symptom of cataplexy. Uh, what we call narcolepsy type 2 is the same findings on the sleep studies, but no cataplexy. And then the third thing in the narcolepsy or excessive daytime sleepiness spectrum is um, what we call idiopathic hypersomnia. So the, the MSLT does not show that um, the two REM periods or two naps with REM, uh, but the patient falls asleep in less than eight minutes on average on the naps. So, you know, again, narcolepsy is a relatively rare diagnosis, but it clearly has uh, implications in terms of driving and operating heavy machinery and, you know, uh, doing well in school and things like that. So it's important to recognize uh, these symptoms and then order the appropriate testing. Um, you know, narcolepsy is a deficiency of, of hypocretin. And in um, some research settings, it is possible to measure the hypocretin level in the CSF to confirm the diagnosis. And the patients who have the absolute lowest or absent hypocretin in their CSF are the ones with narcolepsy type 1. It's just that that test is really not um, clinically available yet in, in widespread use. So how do we treat narcolepsy? Um, you know, we stress the importance of getting adequate uh, sleep hours, you know, avoiding sedatives, having good sleep behaviors. For some patients, short um, intentional naps during the day can be helpful. And then we have um, this medication list. And again, this is from a recent publication from the Mayo Clinic that was a review of uh, disorders of excessive daytime sleepiness. And you can see step one for narcolepsy treatment is the alerting agents, modafinil or armodafinil. 
um, step two are the, the two new, uh, new to the market, also alerting agents um, that you can see there. And step three, if those uh, step one and step two are not effective, we use a slow release uh, methylphenidate. And finally, um, if the patient is refractory to those therapies, we do consider chronic amphetamine use. And then the drug sodium oxabate, um, uh, which is called Xyrem, um, is reserved for patients with cataplexy. This, this drug, I mean, we rarely prescribe it, but if the patient does have cataplexy, we will consider starting them on sodium oxabate. It's actually restricted, uh, very restricted because it's the same chemical basically as the date rape drug. It's only available from one pharmacy in the US and you have to be a, a physician or clinician who's uh, trained in the use of it. So this is, is kind of the bottom line on narcolepsy. So this patient that I described to you, 30 years old, uh, complaining of excessive daytime sleepiness. He also had some sleep paralysis at night and excessively vivid dreams. So he has narcolepsy type two. And again, the, the treatment uh, for him was stressing the importance of adequate sleep hours and then uh, an alerting agent. There was no indication for the sodium oxabate because he didn't have cataplexy. All right, so let's turn to uh, another type of sleep disorder. And again, I think that this, this patient three represents one of the sort of below the surface things that um, patients often don't complain of or come to medical attention unless perhaps they're asked about it. So this, this is a um, typical patient that we see like this who comes in, he's uh, 71. He's a normal uh, BMI, normal body habitus type patient, you know, has sort of the usual hypertension, hyperlipidemia medications. And um, like many patients has been started on an SSRI for uh, depression, anxiety uh, type symptoms. And you know, um, this patient is complaining of moving excessively in bed. Um, I fell out of bed. Um, and sometimes it really comes out, you have to ask the patient, but the, or the patient's being brought in by their spouse, but they've actually you know, hit their, spouse, their bed partner, or punched them, or they, again, have bruised themselves or injured themselves in some way because of these excessive movements in sleep. And then these patients also complain of being fatigued during the day, generally not hypersomnolent. So this um, falls into the category of sleep-related movement disorders. Um, and when we talk to patients who complain of, of these type of symptoms, we try to figure out from the patient or from the bed partner where in the sleep cycle that these um, excessive movements occur. Um, because if they're occurring all night, uh, throughout the night, you know, that would suggest perhaps um, even a seizure disorder. Um, but if they're early in the night, that's usually associated with non-REM sleep, what we call a non-REM sleep parasomnia. And if they're later in the sleep cycle when, when patients tend to have more REM sleep, um, that's what we call a REM uh, parasomnia. And just a couple of take home points about this. I mean, again, you often have to really tease these uh, symptoms out of the patient, but it is something to ask patients, um, particularly older patients about uh, when they come in complaining of, of poor sleep quality. If the, you know, you wanna ask them if they have any excessive body movements during sleep. You really, it's really important to get a good medication history from these patients. And you might wanna consider um, if they're having these um, parasomnia activities to check their uh, CBC and ferritin because there is an association between low iron uh, levels and having um, uh, limb movement abnormalities during sleep. And we do recommend a sleep study with video monitoring to, to assess these sleep-related movement disorders. And I, I just really wanted to point out this particular type of sleep uh, movement disorder, which is called uh, RBD or REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, what this is, is that the patients complain essentially of acting out their dreams. And that's because um, th they have what we call atonia during REM sleep. 
or they have absence of atonia, sorry. So, you know, normally all of us, when we're in REM sleep, our muscles are essentially paralyzed except for our diaphragms. Um, and people with this disorder have movements during REM sleep, and we can see that on the sleep study. We can see it in their muscle monitors, and we can see it on video. And this, this be, you know, REM behavior disorder is, is, very, is quite uncommon, but it has a marked uh, predilection for males over the age of 50. And um, if the patient has this complaint, again, it's real important to check their medication history because SSRIs and other antidepressants can trigger this and alcohol and um, other substance withdrawal can be a risk factor for this. So um, you do need to ask the patient about these kind of medications. But there is a what we call a, a primary form of RBD, and this um, is again an important diagnosis to make if a patient is complaining of this, because there's a high conversion rate to neurodegenerative diseases. And, uh, particularly Parkinson's, um, Lewy body dementia, and multiple system atrophy. So um, again, a rare disease, a rare disorder, but something that um, does come up in primary care, and um, people should be aware of that. That this is not a psychiatric disorder. This is this is a REM sleep parasomnia. So in, in our patient, patient number three, who was taking an SSRI, you know, the first thing we did was get him off that drug, um, educated the patient about the disorder. We talked to these patients about modifying their sleep environment so they, they minimize the chance of getting hurt. And then the drug of choice for this, if, um, if it persists off the offending drugs, is uh, actually clonazepam. And usually we couple melatonin with it, although there's kind of scant evidence uh, for the benefit of melatonin, um, you know, the problem is taking clonazepam long-term can be a challenge, particularly in older patients who are at risk for these other problems that might complicate the use of clonazepam. So that's my third patient example, just to highlight um, the, the movement disorders of sleep and particularly the ones that we see in, in older patients. And then I'm going to spend the last, the last part of our talk here um, discussing, you know, what we sleep doctors see most commonly, which is uh, sleep disorder breathing. Um, and again, I'll just talk about a patient, you know, a typical patient with, with um, suspicious for sleep apnea, uh, overweight patient with, you know, comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, you know, it's pretty easy diagnosis if the patient comes in and, you know, with the recording of their breathing during sleep or with the bed partner talking about their snoring or the observation of obstructed breathing and then fatigue and sleepiness during the day. Lately, you know, it's been interesting with uh, the gig work environment that um, more and more patients are applying for commercial driver's licenses to drive an Uber and, you know, just, a fun fact is that to get a commercial driver's license, um, the, pay, the applicants do get screened for the presence of sleep apnea, including measuring their neck circumference. So um, we've been seeing more and more people come in and getting denied a commercial driver's license because they're at risk for sleep apnea based on body habitus. But anyway, um, this is from the New England Journal Review that I highly recommend from a couple of years ago. You know, I think we all know the symptoms um, that should trigger our suspicion that the patient might have OSA, uh, snoring, daytime sleepiness, unrefreshing sleep, regardless of duration of sleep. Uh, you know, some of the other things the patients have sometimes are morning headaches. Uh, you know, we know about the BMI greater than 30. But one thing that I think is somewhat under-recognized is patients who are retronathic or micronathic. Um, these patients, you know, usually have a normal BMI, but their anatomy lends itself to um, closing up of their airway uh, when they're sleeping, particularly when they're supine. So we know what OSA is, episodic um, sleep state dependent upper airway collapse. And the consequence of that is um, reduction in airflow, intermittent hypoxia, 
hypercapnia uh, episodes during sleep, arousals from sleep, and we quantitate this as the number of these respiratory events per hour. And we consider mild uh, sleep disorder breathing to be in the range there that you see, 5 to 15, moderate 15 to 30 episodes per hour, and severe more than 30 times an hour. And the consequences I think we're all familiar with. Um, you know, when we talk to patients about, about sleep disorder breathing, you know, we stress kind of the day-to-day, -day. it causes poor quality sleep, it might contribute to you having nocturia, um, you're probably sleepy during the day, sometimes that manifests as, you know, falling asleep, sometimes as a motor vehicle accident, but sometimes it's just kind of being cranky and sort of depressed and blah, you know, having a bad personality sometimes is one of the symptoms of, of having sleep apnea. And of course, you know, it can contribute over the longer term to cardiovascular and cerebrovascular consequences. Um, you know, risk factors, again, I think everybody is familiar with the various risk factors for OSA. It's not just obesity. Um, people with these other problems are certainly at risk. And uh, again, I would stress, you know, the craniofacial abnormalities. Um, you know, it's funny now with everybody wearing a mask, you can't really tell until you ask them to take the mask down what their jaw looks like. So we have to remember that in, in our uh, sleep medicine practice. And then, of course, chronic uh, nasal and sinus disease and then some other systemic diseases put people at risk. And the history, you know, comes from the patient, the bed partner. Did want to mention some of the screening tools that we use. And, you know, more and more patients are coming in with these various devices like Fitbits, Auras, the WHOOP device, um, saying, geez, you know, I know I have sleep apnea or I have this and that when they're asleep because of these devices. Um, we do use these screening questionnaires. Um, I think people are somewhat familiar with uh, the Epworth, which is uh, the, uh, a way to assess daytime sleepiness. There's six questions, um, and the patient uh, assesses how likely it is uh, to fall asleep in each of those scenarios. And, you know, 24 out of 24 um, score here is severe daytime sleepiness. Anything over 10 uh, is considered to be abnormally sleepy on the Epworth. And then in the hospital and in our practices, we use the uh, stop bang, which is asked about some other things, including hypertension, uh, weight, and uh, neck circumference greater than 40 centimeters. One of the things on physical exam that we look at is, is the patency of the upper airway, and we use the anesthesia-derived malampati classification uh, to assess how um, tight or closed up the airway is uh, when, when the patient is asked to open their mouth. So, uh, you know, a question that comes up a lot, and especially um, now that we've moved the sleep lab off campus is, you know, should the patient have a full polysomnogram or should they have a home sleep test? And, you know, here's the difference. The full polysomnogram, we measure a lot of different parameters. There are 16 uh, channels measured. It includes uh, not only airflow and oxygen saturation, but we have an EEG going on the patient. We have uh, muscle monitors and uh, we have a snoring microphone, whereas the home sleep test has um, only the respiratory monitors. And so, you know, the, for the full sleep test, we still use a wired montage, a lot of wires attached to the patient. For the home sleep test, it's, it's really respiratory and oximetry, and there's these strain gauges that the patient wears um, because that helps us tell if there's um, effort. You know, that's how we differentiate between obstructive and, and central sleep apnea. And, you know, here's the... Um, the algorithm for deciding, according to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, whether the patient should have a, a in-lab polysomnogram or a home sleep test. So basically, if the patient has comorbidities, um, the recommendation is to have an a in-lab study. So if they have significant cardiopulmonary disease, if you're concerned about respiratory muscle weakness, 
um, neuromuscular conditions, chronic medication use like opioids, or if they have you know symptoms um, that are not just sleep apnea like leg movements or significant insomnia, then the recommendation is a full polysomnogram. If the patient really presents with the high suspicion or a fair suspicion of having just sleep apnea, then a home sleep test is perf perfectly acceptable. You know, we want to differentiate between central uh, um, sleep apnea where there's no effort and no airflow versus obstructive, and we can do that on a home sleep study as well as obviously with the in-lab polysomnogram. Many, many people have obstructive sleep apnea, um, you know, and there's probably many more. It's estimated up to 24 million people that are not yet diagnosed in the United States. And, you know, when we're going to treat the patients, we really think about doing it not based just on the apnea hypopnea index or the respiratory event index, but also on um, the patient's symptoms. So a patient with a low AHI, but who's severely sleepy or has comorbidities, you know, we're going to treat those patients, patients with the, a high HSI, we're going to recommend treatment as well. So just briefly, you know, I think everybody's familiar with the treatment of sleep disordered breathing in terms of just conservative measures like avoiding supine sleep, avoiding sedatives and alcohol at bedtime. Um, but then interventions, you know, are tried and true is CPAP. Some patients can use an oral appliance and bariatric surgery is an option for the overweight sleep apnea patient. So just, you know, very quickly, CPAP, we have a lot of different modalities now. It's still the gold standard of treatment for all types of obstructive sleep apnea. It's been around for, you know, 30 plus years at this point and, and is very effective. Some of the advantages is how well it works um, and it's easy to try on the patient. You know, some of the perceived disadvantages is uh, adherence and the cumbersomeness of the device and um, just the challenges for patients to, to use it every night. So I, you know, just again, um, uh, you know, we're really into educating the patient about the value of PAP treatment. Uh, we want to choose the right patient. Uh, we want to use all our resources available to, to fit the patient properly for the mask, and then we monitor adherence. And honestly, one of the key things is how well the patient does right at the beginning of their CPAP therapy. Um, there, that's been shown in, in a number of studies that the first night is actually quite predictive of how well they'll do. And, you know, we do want the patient to use it throughout sleep, but at a minimum of for four to five hours. And, um, uh, you know, honestly, one of the biggest things I think that's helped recently is the compliance tools. Um, the machines themselves give the patients a, a readout every morning. Um, there's apps now that the patient, you know, can look at to um, assess how many hours they use the device and also how effective it was. Um, on, on the previous night. And, you know, I think this encouragement from feedback from the machine has, has been very helpful in uh, getting more patients to adhere to PAP. And, you know, one of the other great advances over the last five to six years has been the, the fact that we can get data out of the machine that shows not only how much the patient uses the device, but what the effectiveness of the device. And this has really obviated the need for repeated sleep studies to titrate PAP because um, the machines automatically adjust to the right pressure, breath to breath. And again, this feedback loop that we get is, is just very, very helpful um, for tailoring the treatment to the patient. These are some of the other um, options, uh, an oral appliance um, that the dentist actually makes. And that's the recommendation of the guideline that it's a qualified dentist who makes a custom quote unquote titratable device. And that means that the device can be um, the ratcheted forward to pull the mandible forward in order to open the, the retropharyngeal space for uh, alleviating the apnea. So they come in various things. They have these ratchets. They have, some of them have a screw in the front that, um, 
you, what the patient does is sort of gradually advance the mandible for comfort and, and uh, until the apnea goes away. Um, the only surgery really at this point that is effective and recommended for OSA is, is maxillomandibular advancement surgery where um, the jaw is, is realigned. And, you know, this is a complicated surgery that's done by a craniofacial surgeon. Um, there's orthodontics involved with this. But patients that are young particularly and have significant apnea and have um, this type of anatomy uh, really can get an excellent result from surgery to manage their OSA. And probably you've seen, you know, people who watch TV, they're actually advertising now this upper airway stimulation device, uh, which is an implanted device um, to activate the hypoglossal nerve. Um, it's, it's indicated for a small slice of patients with, with OSA. They have to fit into these criteria. Um, you can see that they can't be significantly overweight and they have to have failed PAP therapy. So more to come on this, but I, I've been surprised when I turn on the television late at night that they're advertising the Inspire device here um, because it is quite a big deal to get this procedure done with a, essentially an implanted um, stimulator device. And finally, weight management. We never want to lose sight of the fact in the overweight patient with OSA that um, weight reduction really can have a be beneficial effect, particularly in the patients who are the highest end of the BMI spectrum. So just to conclude, you know, a patient with sleep apnea, um, we, you know, have a low threshold when we're significantly suspicious in a straightforward patient to do a, um, a home sleep study. Uh, we reserve the in-lab polysomnogram for patients with more complex issues, comorbidities, patients who have cognitive disorders. And really, um, OSA treatment, I think, has been revolutionized by all the tools we have now to auto-adjust and, and to monitor uh, compliance. And patients really do buy into this. I mean, it, it really helps to explain the technology is smart now, and we can get a lot of data from the patient. Um, I'm going to skip this. I mean, I, I think I want to leave enough time for questions. I just want to say, where are we going with OSA diagnostics? This is uh, something from um, a Belgian sleep doctor's son, who see this little pad here that goes on the chin and connects to the phone and supposedly makes the diagnosis of OSA. You know, if you lived in the UK the, the, and you were suspected of having sleep apnea, basically you're just given a CPAP machine without any diagnostic testing. I mean, that's not the way we do things here, but, you know, sometimes I think we definitely overcomplicate um, our, our things for our OSA patients. And there's just a lot of things in the pipeline potentially for treatment beyond sleep apnea that's more targeted to the patient's specific uh, physiology. And finally, I, I saw this interesting um, paper that was just published um, that, you know, talked a little bit about the paucity of education on sleep and sleep medicine in our medical school curriculums and in our residency and fellowships. So I'm glad you gave me the time to give this talk today. Um, but this was an interesting study from Israel. They actually assessed a bunch of medical students' uh, sleep quality, which by the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index and by their Epworth was pretty poor. And then they gave them a lecture on sleep and um, the, the lecture helped them to understand sleep disorders better, but it didn't improve the quality of these uh, medical students' sleep. So I think we do have a ways to go both to help our patients and, and to help ourselves when it, when it comes to sleep. Um, so my take home points are, you know, uh, the big four sleep diagnoses, uh, everyone's going to encounter these patients um, in primary care and in other specialties. And um, just hope that you, you sort of heard my highlights about treating the, the insomnia, the hypersomnolence, movement disorders, and sleep disorder breathing. And I just want to, you know, give everybody an update because we have moved the sleep lab itself, the sleep center, out to Montgomery uh, in general which is quite a challenge for some patients to get out there, but it, it is our sleep lab staffed by our tech 
technologists. We do have our home sleep program still here right in our practice that we dispense the home units from, from our office. And, um, you know, we have our colleagues in our other disciplines um, who are also sleep medicine specialists who help us a great deal with these patients. 